So my name is Nick Valeski. I am the vegetable IPM associate for our Utah State University Extension IPM program. I serve the entire state of Utah and I'm the guy behind the seasonal vegetable pest advisories. With Extension, I work to provide education, research, and outreach, especially to our state's commercial vegetable farmers, along with home gardeners as well. My educational background is in horticulture and applied science. My experience from the past several years has been mainly in commercial vegetable production, plant pathology, entomology, and of course, integrated pest management. So what exactly is integrated pest management? Integrated pest management or IPM is a comprehensive approach to pest control that uses a combined means to reduce the status of pests to tolerable levels while maintaining a quality environment. So that's a really kind of in-depth definition. So let's discuss exactly what is the IPM concept. Well, IPM has a broad application. It integrates management of all pests. It's a holistic approach, it's ecologically based, and it can be applied to any ecosystem. So what does IPM integrate? Well, it integrates multiple pest management tactics like chemical control, biological control, cultural and mechanical control. It integrates management of multiple pests so that includes insects, weeds, diseases, pathogens, nematodes, vertebrae, et cetera. It integrates pest management tactics on an area wide basis. So many pest control situations are better handled on a large scale or regional basis. And it reduces pests to tolerable levels. So it does not emphasize pest eradication or elimination. We just want to get the pests to tolerable levels. Um, IPM incorporates economic sustainability. So we will discuss the economic injury level and economic threshold concepts on a later slide. And then we can also incorporate other important factors such as maintenance of aesthetic quality. So that's really important if you're a landscape designer. And then lastly, it incorporates environmental and social concerns. So let's talk about the things that are goals of an IPM program. One, it optimizes profits over the long term. Two, it sustains our resources, especially in agricultural or natural resource settings over the long term. It gives us um, one goal is to have a rational use of pesticides. We want to reduce environmental contamination and costs involving our soil, groundwater, surface water, pollinators, wildlife, and other endangered species. We want to utilize natural biological controls. We want to conserve and augment. We want to use selective pesticides, proper timing of those applications. And then obviously we want to minimize pesticide resistance problems. We want to minimize pest resurgence and secondary pest outbreaks, often caused by the elimination of natural enemies with pesticides. And then, of course, food safety is a goal. We want to reduce residues of pesticides on our food products. And then most importantly, human safety is the main goal. We rely on pest management tactics that are safe for ourselves and others. So listed here, I have four key steps to an IPM program. And these are things you should all know. One is know your pests in the plant ecosystem. You wanna be able to decide what is an unacceptable pest damage for your situation. Then you wanna consider all the available pest management practices, which we will talk about. And then lastly, you wanna time pest controls with windows of opportunity. So identifying these windows of opportunity. All pests, all types of pests have a life cycle or a set of developmental events that occur during their lifetime. The types of life cycle will vary with the pest. However, most pests have certain weak points or windows of opportunities during their life cycle when they are the most vulnerable to control. 
For insects, these windows are often during the immature stages. Weeds are typically easiest to control during their seedling stage. So early in the season when they are just beginning to grow um, like annuals or late in the season when they're preparing for dormancy like our perennial plants. Diseases are often easiest to control by using a preventative or early intervention tactics before the disease begins developing or becomes established. Sorry about that. Um, and then of course we wanna optimize management of a pest control tactics should be targeted for these weak points. So you can see in this diagram, we have the standard insect life cycle with the adults, the eggs, the immature stage, and then the pupa. So obviously a pupa, we can't usually target that stage because it's in the ground. And sometimes adults are tricky because they're highly mobile. So usually we want to try to get the immature stage when we're controlling pests. So now we're going to go over cultural, mechanical, biological, and chemical control management within integrated pest management. So let's start with these cultural control practices. We have land and water management. So with this, we want to maintain an ecosystem in a healthy state to minimize the competitiveness of pests in some situations, water levels can be regulated to reduce pest problems. So this can involve like mosquitoes or aquatic weeds, or if you have a garden, you want to avoid over or underwatering your plants to minimize stress. Um, next, we have a disking or tilling. This can disrupt any overwintering life stage of an insect or disease pest. And then weeding. Removing weeds around your production site is a good idea because weeds often serve as an alternate host for insects and diseases. And then sanitation or just garden cleanup. If you can remove, prune, gather, burn plant parts and debris that serve as a protective or overwintering site for many pests, that's a good idea. Then we have habitat diversification. So in monoculture situations, so like a cornfield, an orchard, or turf grass, um, diversification of vegetation in the habitat may sub subsequently increase the diversity of animal life in that habitat because such diversification can attract beneficial and pest organisms. So you have that healthy balance. And then crop rotation. This makes it challenging for pests to access their target host if they are relocated every season. And then I listed um, sourcing tolerant or resistant species and cultivars. Select insect and disease resistant species and cultivars of plants um, whenever they're available. For perennial plants, select species and cultivars that are cold hardy um, because a winter damaged plant like a tree can be more susceptible to attack by pests. And most seed catalogs will have a diagram that'll explain what varieties have resistance to certain diseases or insect pests. And then lastly, we wanna focus on the nutrition of our soil and the fertility management. So although you cannot change the soil type in your area, there are some practices you can follow to improve the growing conditions for your plants. Um, proper fertilization is important, but over fertilization can lead to excessive lush growth that can be attractive to like aphids and other foliar pests. Increasing organic matter of the soil where it is low can improve the growth and health of your plants overall as well. So next we have mechanical control practices. So this might seem like an obvious one, but hand removal. When you hand pull weeds or other pests, you're physically removing them from the situation. And that's obviously probably the number one form of pest control. Um, mowing, if you mow down weeds, especially before they start to produce seeds, this can be in a very effective pest management tool for the long term. Using physical barriers. There are many types of physical barriers that can be used to block and disrupt the movement of pests. For example, a sticky band around the trunk of a tree can discourage pests from climbing up. 
And then in this picture, I have row covers. And then traps. So attractive traps can be used to mass trap and remove pests from the environment or to monitor their activities so they can control actions can be appropriately timed. Traps are primarily used for insects and vertebrate pests and some disease pests as well. Attractive traps um, typically use visual cues, so like this yellow sticky trap and or odors and pheromones like food baits. So like this slug trap you see here. So passive traps can be placed in areas common with pest activity and use wind currents to catch the pest. So next we have biological control. We define biological control. So we define biological control as any activity of one species that reduces the adverse effects of another. So for example, we have predators. This is an organism that eats or consumes another. So this can be like predatory insects or predatory mites, or even like reptiles or birds that eat insects. We have parasites. This is an organism that lives in or on another and it kills it. So we'll call that like a parasitoid while it's completing its life cycle. So here we have a samurai wasp parasitizing stink bug eggs. Then we have pathogens. These are microbial agents that attack and invade other organisms. So this could be like a bacteria, a virus, or a nematode. And then sometimes there's herbivorous insects that eat weeds, which is pretty cool. So an example I have is the bindweed mite, which you might be familiar with. And it's important to know that biological control agents can be purchased from commercial suppliers and released for supplementary, supplementary control of pests. Biological um, control release can be intuitive. So like if you flood an area with agents to reduce a pest over a short term, or it can be inoculative where you have like a slow release so they can colonize and spread themselves. However, most biological control occurs with um, out the assistance of people. Many predators and parasites and pathogens occur naturally and are continually working to keep nature in balance. The importance of natural enemies is often not appreciated until a broad spectrum pesticide, which can kill many beneficial insects as well as the targeted pest is applied. And a new pest is suddenly released from biological control because of a serious problem. So there are things you can do to encourage the activities of biological control agents already present in your environment. The main thing is to avoid the use of broad spectrum pesticides unless necessary. Use selective pesticides and target them to pest problem spots. So lastly, we have chemical control. So this includes our pesticides. So we define pesticides as any substance applied to control insects, fungi, bacteria, weeds, vertebrae, or other pests. So since the advent of synthetic pesticides in the 1940s, pest managers have become very reliant on their generally simple to use, fast acting, and effective attributes to manage the majority of pest problems. However, in recent times, the resistance of pests to pesticides has become high because, because of they've continually used them. So to reduce the reliance on pesticides as a single pronged approach to pest management, pest management should become familiar with those other forms we talked about, cultural, mechanical, and biological. So although pesticides have been perhaps overused in recent decades, they're still an important tool within our IPM toolbox. So the avoidance of overuse will allow them to remain a viable pest control option for many decades to come. So we have many types of chemicals used before the development of synthetic pesticides that are becoming popular. Once again, there are called like organic pest control options. Um, in addition, many new chemical products are being developed and made available, such as biologicals and insect growth reg regulators. So first we have synthetic pesticides. These are human made in a laboratory. They're chemically joined compounds or elements. 
And this usually includes most of our herbicides um, with act and like other products with active ingredients like malathion, carborol, venomol, stuff like that. And then we have organic pesticides. So these are naturally occurring. They're derived from plant or animal materials um, like rocks or petroleum oil sources. So this could be like neem oil, sulfur, um, copper, pyrethrums, stuff like that. And then of course we have biological pesticides. So this is a subset of organic pesticides or kind of like a subgroup. And these specifically refer to products that develop from naturally occurring microbial agents, such as bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Bacillus thuringiensis is probably the most common one we see, which you might have heard is called BT. And spinosad is another one. So, and then lastly, we have insect growth regulators or IGRs. These kill insects by interfering with their normal process of juvenile development. So common insect growth regulators disrupt either the insect's hormonal process or exoskeleton development. So just to review, we talked about cultural control options, mechanical control options, biological control options, and chemical control options. So let's talk about the economic injury level concept. So this looks complicated, but once I explain it, it'll make a lot of sense. So the economic injury level concept was developed hand in hand with the integrated pest management concept and is used to promote more rational use of pesticides to avoid pesticide resistance and reduce problems with the pesticide residue on our agricultural products and reduce the negative effects of pesticides on non-target organisms. So some definitions, this blue line right here represents our economic injury level. This is the lowest population density of a pest that will cause economic damage or the amount of pest injury, which will justify the cost of control. This brown line here is the action threshold. So this is the pest density at which control measures should be implemented to prevent it from reaching the economic injury level. So the point where there's economic loss occurs. So as farmers or gardeners, we want to be strategic with the timing of our pest control. So these graphs are showing the insect populations on the left and then the time or the length of the season on the bottom. So if the insect population passes the economic injury level, so above the blue line, it would not be worth our time to manage. But if we manage right before that line at the action threshold, um, then we would be saving time, labor, and money because the cost of control um, allows for the correct benefits, if that makes sense. Okay, so we just spent a lot of time talking about um, the different control practices of integrated pest management, but none of that's going to serve you well unless you guys are actually good at scouting for the pest. So when you're scouting for the pest, you can't just like look at your garden from the window. You got to get out there and you got to go look down at the canopy of the plants. Um, you want to look at the leaves, you want to look at the nodes, the fruits, the stem, the crown of the plant, and then if necessary, you might have to dig up the roots too if there's a serious problem. If you're scouting a large farm or field, you want to make sure you walk around in a well-represented area. So here's a picture of a cantaloupe field that I go to often. And I start at one point and I kind of do a zigzag pattern throughout the field. And then I'll pick random plants to stop at and then do a closer observation. And then I always want to make sure I'm looking at the field edges because there tends to be a lot of pest pressure there from neighboring fields. Or if there's like a damp or wet area, I want to look there as well because there tends to be a lot of diseases. 
when you're out scouting for pests, you want to be looking for two things, signs and symptoms. So symptoms are a plant's reaction to the pest. So this can include dead plant parts, um, changes in the growth, changes in the appearance, so the color or the texture. Um, a sign is a plant, or sorry, a sign is the physical evidence of a pest on the plant. So this can include like the actual pest itself, um, evidence of the pest, so observed mechanical damage, secretions from the plants, and then just kind of a damaged pattern like we see with the leaf miners or the burrowing holes. So now let's talk about some supplies you might use when you are out scouting for a plant. These are all ones that I use frequently. The first is a beading tray. So what I do is I hold this underneath the canopy of a plant and then I'll shake the foliage. And this will dislodge any nymphs, adults, larvae, or really small insects, so I can see them easier. And if they're really small, I can use a 10 to 30 magnification hand lens. And again, this is really helpful for viewing aphids or other small insects. Um, we have a sweep net, which you can use to collect flying insects, so like our moth or butterfly pest. And you can also do sweep counts and like an alfalfa field. And then I like to use yellow sticky traps to monitor for insect pests over a long period of time. Um, next, I use a field notebook, which I like to document the pests. So I'll write down the location, the host plant it was on, how many pests there were, and then the time. And then I can refer that from week to week or month to month or even year to year. Sometimes I like to measure the plant specimens or the insect specimens. And then sometimes I like to take them back to our diagnostic lab. So I'll use like a Ziploc bag or vials. And then I like to use little paint brushes, which are good for collecting aphids or other really small insects without crushing them. And then I always take with me some field guides, which these are available to you guys as well online. And this helps with the identification of insects and diseases.